my process is um, on everything uh -huh. um, is a mirror image of that. Mm. Uh, so and I think that's um, that's more for me. So that could be one of the, one of the topics we cover. <laughs> yeah, you say mirror image of that. What's that? Uh, meaning, I don't do. Um, I've never had dreams, um, and as a function of that, I I just pay attention to what's happening. So I'm very bottoms up instead of top down. Mm. Um, I've never made lists of what I'm looking for. Mm. I just in I'm present in front of the person in front of me, mm. and then I go from there. Um, wow! So I pay attention to what's here and not what's um, um, you know what's my design or criteria. That's number one. The second thing is. Um, I've always picked people based on what I can do for them, mm. um, not what they um, could do for me. Mm. And um, so that's, those are like images, examples of mirror image. No, that's beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, let's, let's definitely dive deeper there because mm -hmm. that's contrary to at least my education upbringing. Sure, sure. Well, like and, and yeah, 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 and all these yeah, other exactly. Things. We've all been trained to think a certain way. Yeah. Um, I'm not trying to be contrarian. I just focus on what I think is truth. Mm. And so these things are all like emergent properties of the... Yeah, of, um, uh, that's beautiful. Yeah. I can see I can see a little bit why Gil's like, yeah, you got to talk to June. <laughs> I love Gil. I love Gil. Gil's a great guy. Yeah. You know, his, um, his former girlfriend's house just burned down in Malibu. So. Oh, shit. Um, we're all trying to find ways to be constructive, and mm. you know, this is a you know it's a hard time for a lot of people. Mm. Um, but I wrote an essay yesterday. Um, so I write essays um, for different reasons, and I wrote an essay um, from the perspective of a tree instead of all the human casualty. I mean, it's been horrible, mm. horrible for humans, mm. number of life loss and property damage, and people that are displaced. Um, so there's a lot of coverage there, mm. um, but I, I wrote a essay about the wildfire mm. uh, from, a, from the perspective that is unaccounted for, which is mm. trees, the numbers, um, nobody got evacuated, they all died in mm. spot. Um, so I spent the last day kind of mm. dwelling on that. Mm. Um, a lot of places we can go from. Number one, let me first thank you once again for thank you for having me for 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 <laughs> sharing your. One of the thing I realize more and more as I get older, is we can have all of the resources in the world, but time, mm -hmm. you don't get back time. So I don't take people's time lightly. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for being so generous, for saying yes. Um, thank you for having me. I, I love giving time and creating time for others. Yeah. That's the way I think about the longevity initiative is mm. creation of time for others. Mm. But there are other ways to create time for each other in mm. the immediacy. So we can talk about uh, how to give the gift of time mm. like today. Oh, wow. So many things. Yeah. I'm so intrigued about <laughs> your point of view. So let me give you a little background. I don't know if you saw the description. I did. Oh, you yeah, did? Yeah, okay, noble good. warrior. Noble warrior. I love the concept. Are we live, by the way? We are live, like, yeah. Okay. Um, so, so many intriguing points to start already. Um, I'm really actually even more excited now, now that we have done a little introduction. Um, I'm so glad that Gil put this together. Mm -hmm. So one of my standard questions I always ask is, what are some of the pivotal moments that happened in your childhood that made you the person that you are today? Hmm. Uh, you know, I, I generally dwell a lot in the present, so retrieval from the past or thinking about the future is something I had to like actively work at. Sure. Um, um, I've, I've also had a number of concussions from playing hockey. So oh, my, I see. Uh, You're my, a hockey player. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I played right. hockey for many years, and uh, I love the game, but uh, the head injury, I mean, I would say that's, uh, that's had a profound impact. Mm -hmm. uh, I've lost a lot of skills. I've recovered a lot of skills, too. Mm -hmm. um, but as a, you know, I always think I had a blissful childhood, but mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe this is, that's what I remember. Mm. Um, so I could talk about the things I do remember um, that stand out. Okay. Just um, in respond to your question. So, uh, you know, I come from an old farming family. Our, our family settled early. Um, I'm um, 38th generation descended from a farming family. Mm. Um, uh, 
from Shindao Yun. Um, so he was um, he was a minister back in the day. So our family started in 892, um, and um, and then we have a village in um, Central Korea that is protected. It's beautiful land. Uh, there's no reason to be there uh, otherwise. So it's been really protected and preserved. Um, and you know, there's 500 households. Um, all the last names are Yoon, mm. um, and. Uh, it was an incredible place um, to call home. Now, I spent a lot of time in Seoul, um, but my grandfather and my father um, you know, grew up in the village. So to me, um, that's home. Mm. Um, so I have a sense of homeland um, that dates back to childhood that a lot of Americans... Americans are more forward-looking. Um, mm-hmm. That's one of the things that's great about America. Mm-hmm. But not having memory is a good thing. Mm. Um, well, I don't have a ton of memories. I have a sense of home. Um, and... When you think about home, the word um, homeland um, is something that, or even hometown, mm. is something that um, is really an administrative term for most Americans. They talk about where they grew up. Um, but to me, hometown and homeland is an emotional thing. Mm. And so I can only describe it in metaphors. Mm. You know, the, the, the town's um, you know, got a name, but to me, it's a, it's a sense um, in my my dad feels it my grandfather talked Mm -hmm. about it Um, so I can only talk indirectly about it um, Mm -hmm. because the um, English language the word hometown is I think only like 80 years old Mm -hmm. it's really in neologism I I think it's um, it's a completely different sense Mm -hmm. Um, the closest proxy is the word patria Mm -hmm. which is Latin Um, but if you read the great Latin writers even by the time they were talking about patria they said it had lost the original sense. Mm. The original sense being home, mm. and now it meant it started to meant where you're from. Again, it's gone from an emotional uh, term to a administrative term. Mm. So that's my home, um, and uh, I specifically remember things about my grandfather, mm. um, and I remember his actions. But the lessons I learned took decades to understand. Um, you know, so all the, the um, you know, our ancestors are buried on the hill. Mm. And, um, and you know, he, uh, he would ask me to help tend to the, um, the tombstones. So there's, mm. imagine, just rows and rows of ancestors, right? Mm. Um, so my experience of that is immediately from a young age, wow, I mean, life is short. Um, How because young were you? Oh, I was, this is all, like, pre-teen. So pre-teen. As a child, yeah. Oh, wow, yeah. so you had a glimpse of impermanence even in preteen well you get a sense of um, uh, the telescoping of the generations mm. um, that life is short not just an impermanent but just how short it is mm. like you can see back hundreds of years in one eye gaze right mm. um, so it's incredibly liberating because mm. at that point okay you're like okay you can live a life of honor and that's about it mm. um, um, that's not my experience back then, but that's what I sort of interpreted and reinterpreted and reinterpreted over the years. Mm. Um, you know, and I would ask him, you know, Grandpa, um, why are you making me do this? Because, you know, I was, a, I was a kid and it just seemed like, you know, it was hot, it was dusty, um, it was scary. And he would never answer my question. He would just say, just, you know, pick, pick your spot. <laughs> that would be his response. Like um, your future spot. Yeah, 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 yeah. No yeah, shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Amazing. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> that amazing. Um, and it took me years to again absorb all that. Like, like he was just mm. giving me a sense of place and time. Mm. Um, and in our family's lore, I mean, um, you know, we hear about our ancestors from a thousand years ago. And so when you're young, the idea of a thousand years feels like infinity because mm. even a summer, even a summer, seemed to last forever. Mm. So a thousand years was not even real. It was mm. fantasy. Mm. So now that I've been around for about 50 years, I have a completely different impression because mm. that 50 years went by in a blink, mm-hmm. like in a blink. Mm-hmm. So then I rethought about 1,000 years. Um, I was actually tying my son's shoe when he was young, and he, he was telling me, he said that 1,000 is a real small number because it's only 2050s. And I literally stopped tying his shoe. I was like, he's right. 1,000 is only 50, only 2050s. Mm-hmm. So now when I process that from the perspective of blinking, 50 years in a blink, a thousand years is only 20 blinks. 
In fact, all of recorded history, 10,000 years, is only 200 blinks. Mm-hmm. Um, we've probably blinked a couple hundred times between us since mm-hmm. we started this conversation. Mm-hmm. So I start to think about everybody in our family lineage and everybody in the entire planet that we have records of as our contemporaries, mm-hmm. that we're all contemporaries. Mm-hmm. We're not ancestors or progenitors or successors. Mm. We've all been here in the approximate same window of time. I just got chills. Thank you. What so a way it gives to me. Think. I'm sorry. So what a way to think. Um, yes, and it gave me an appreciation, yeah. both of them, and it also made me think about people that existed before words and records existed. Mm. You know, who are they, right? Because and even then, it wasn't that long. Two hundred fifty thousand years That's ago, exactly which right. is That's exactly you know right. not not long exactly if you look right. at the grand scheme of things. Yeah. So it's now. Yeah. So that's a memory I have from growing up. The other peculiarity about my grandfather, um, he was a younger brother, so we were on the main line. It's patrilineal, but he was a younger brother, which means he's allowed to leave. Um, but his older brother, who was um, born into the role of stewardship, um, didn't want the role, so he left. And, uh, and um, in you know, a long story short, my, my grandfather eventually found him and brought him back um, uh, near the, um, um, you know, what you call the Russian border uh, back then. It took him two years to find him. I don't know how you find somebody before the age of Facebook. <laughs> but, but on the other hand, people also didn't move around very much. They could go town to town, hear stories. And um, anyway, brought him back. And his, um, you know, his older brother, it wasn't a responsibility. Um, he was born into it, but it's not something you chose. So my uh, grandfather ended up, um, uh, you know, serving the community um, in his own way. And um, one of my favorite memories of him, there's a Korean tradition um, where you bow deeper and hold your bow longer for your elders. Mm. And both by age, but any other sort of form of seniority, you bow deeper and longer. Mm. You start earlier, you hold it longer, and you hold it deeper, and then you pull out of it later. Mm. You know, he did the opposite. So, you know, he'd get up early in the morning, he'd be sweeping the, uh, the streets uh, of the village. Remember, the entire village is just relatives. And a three-year-old would walk by, and it, he would bow deeper and hold a bow deeper. Mm. He did it kind of what you would consider the reverse or as he would consider he do, he would do it in a way that made sense to him mm-hmm. never talked about it and again he wasn't trying to teach me a lesson um, I just appreciated the lessons in my own way downstream much later mm-hmm. and so my my um, my learning from that memory of seeing him was that respect is something you give not something you get mm-hmm. So this is a this ends up being a contrarian message to what we're being told by uh, popular media. You know, we mm. tend to think about respect as something we get, something that's earned, mm. and that's the foundation of lots of unfortunate things. Once you think about respect as something you earn or something you get, mm. you start thinking about, oh, I was disrespected. So mm. the beginning of I'm deserving of something, someone disrespected yeah, exactly, me on exactly. the respect that I deserve. Yeah. So when you think about respect as coming inbound, you start to it starts to contaminate your mind. Mm. It eats away at you. Um, and or you spend a lot of time trying to earn the respect. You mm-hmm. hustle for things uh, that you may or may not get. But it's a very inbound idea. Mm. Whereas if you think about respect as something you give. Like a currency, freely given. Like yeah, that. offered, granted. Granted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Acknowledgement, yeah. Yeah. If you see it in that direction, change the arrow. Mm. None of those other weird thoughts come to your mind. Mm. Mm. Thanks for sharing that. So with that idea, how does it change the way... Now, how, how old were you when you realized that, like that key idea that you just shared? You know, I, I mean, I think there was no single moment. It's just, uh, it is slowly uh, dawned on me over decades. But um, in your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s, in your 50s, just a rough timeline. Um, every step of the way, but it decades. Decades. Certainly by 20s, because so I, I keep reprocessing, reprocessing. 
it informs uh, how I make decisions, um, things I value, what I pick, mm. how I choose. Mm. Um, so it's been happening for a long period of time, and I'm still learning. I, I, I don't know even where I'm sitting. Um, uh, you know, let me give you an example. Um, there was something that Dr. Bob Glazer, who was um, former dean of Stanford Medical School, and I was a young, uh, young resident, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I was that crazy kid. I was always, always very a la carte with school. Mm-hmm. Um, what does that mean? Uh, it's a la carte. I, 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 I picked and chose what uh, I enjoyed and what made sense to me. I see. Um, Which is also not the tip, a tip, it's t- atypical of how people go through school. Probably. I mean, I, 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 didn't, I didn't consume everything that was offered. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was pretty selective and elective. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I didn't always attend class or pay attention, <laughs> but I used that um, gift of time. I create a lot of time for myself, mm-hmm. um, and a big part of who I am is what I did with the time I was able to create. Mm-hmm. Um, and I used to knock on doors of professors I admired. Mm-hmm. I was always curious, um, what else? What else were you thinking? Because academics and sci- science tends to be competitive mm-hmm. and conservative. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a good reason for that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was always curious, what didn't they share? Either there wasn't enough data, it was too early. Because mm-hmm. I know there's 10x the ideas mm-hmm. in people's brains. I and mean, mm-hmm. people think in the internet age, we know everything. No, internet only represents things that have been jotted down. Mm-hmm. But there's 10x the ideas that are in people's mm-hmm. brains. And you only get there by having conversations like this. Mm-hmm. And you, you go and check out Sonia and William Hamilton. I, I loved um, his Hamilton's role. Um, so when I was visiting, you know, when I'm visiting, traveling, I basically use that time to go knock on the doors of professors that I mm-hmm. have read over the years that I admire. And people are always very generous with their time, mm-hmm. kind of like what you're saying earlier in your own journey. Mm-hmm. Um, when people are available, you know, they made time for me. So I always try to pay it forward as well when people knock on my door. Um, it's a gift of time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, wh- I, for example, one of the knock on doors with E.O. Wilson. This is Oh, no kidding. Yeah, this is late 80s. Wow. Um, I ended up spending six months with them. <laughs> wow. How cool is that? Yeah. Holy crap. Like when I went to Santa Barbara, I, I knocked on Napoleon Chagnon's door. So I will never forget the things they said. So, so much of um, what I've done with my life and my thinking and perspective were informed by those conversations, mm. what was not written down. Mm. Or, um, so Bob Glazer... Um, uh, he was very kind. Um, you know, he would take me to the faculty club. We'd have lunch. We'd have coffee at his house. Um, and the, one of the things he said just Excuse stayed me with one me. Second. Sorry about that. What's your um, ethnic background? I'm Chinese. Chinese, okay. Taiwanese. Tell me more specific. Okay, then, yeah. I mean, get this guy under control. Sure, sure. Um, um, yeah, so, Bob Glazer. Uh, Dr. Glazer. He was very kind with me, and he'd take me to the faculty club. We'd have coffee at his house um, and there's so many um, wonderful hours I spent with them and uh, one comment he made stands out mm. uh, you know he used to say June just give people running room that was his advice mm. and um, and I've reinterpreted that statement multiple times in my life mm. um, where the conversation started was talking about um young faculty, postdocs, uh, even residents and students. Um, so rather than, the idea was, his, his, um, his offering was rather than, um, you know, really managing them or creating their future, just give them the space to run and, in fact, if anything, grow their space to run and mm. give them the running room and um, be bottoms up, let them be, mm. you know, and, and support them in whatever dreams and journeys they're on. Wow. So that was my first interpretation. Mm-hmm. Um, and then later, um, I had kids. Mm. And so our instinct on parenting is in, oh, give them running room. Mm. Not only physically. Um, so, you know, our kids have, um, you know, land to run on. And, um, but also just emotionally, you know, actually, um, you know, there are free range kids. Um, and I like that term. 
uh, other people are talking about as well. Um, so give them room to run and um, not over designing it. So the things that uh, they're doing now, when I look at them, they're you know um, sixteen and twelve. Mm. Um, they've they do things they love, and because they love it, um, they learn through love, mm. and then they um, become a steward for the things they love. Mm. Um, I thought about my own childhood. I love baseball. Mm. Uh, it helped me in my own way integrate into America. <laughs> Mm. Um, you know, Jackie Robinson integrated um, the race line in baseball. Mm. Uh, for me, I'm a two-time immigrant. We came twice. Uh, I came at age three, then we went back to Korea, and then um, my dad came back again when I was age 11. So that's how much we love America, two-time immigrant. <laughs> it, it also means that I, uh, I kept forgetting the last language, so I learned two languages twice. Oh, wow. So I don't have a first language. I have two second languages. Mm. <laughs> um, and my second time again, you know, I'd forgotten all my prior English, so I'm relearning it. I mean, we're in suburban Maryland, and um, you know, um, there's a great photo. Of my brother and I, my, my mom, not knowing any better, and very kindly, she dressed my brother and I for first day of school in suburban Maryland in 1978. She dressed us in, uh, and apparently this was trendy at the time, peach plaid leisure suits for first day of school. <laughs> And you were how old? Uh, I was eleven. Eleven. Yeah, I know. I, I we, you know, when we walked into school and the s- and door swung open to the classroom, I turned to my little brother and said, in Korean, and he's speaking English, "We're dead." <laughs> 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 but anything. Memorable but, moments. Anything yeah. but anything but I didn't. Un- I, I didn't obviously didn't get anything out of school that first half day. Yeah. Uh, they were all talking in a language that was foreign to me. Mm. But it was recess. Mm. Um, uh, the uh, a sixth grader threw a ball at me, a football, and I caught it. Oh. Um, I mean, uh, he he meant to throw it, mm. but he threw me a ball. Uh, he wasn't trying to hurt me. Oh, okay. And I caught it and I threw a spiral back because the one thing I could do, growing up as a farm boy, was sports. Mm. And after I threw the pass back, I was instantly one of the boys. Mm. Um, and I uh, fell in love with football, also fell in love with baseball, mm. um, which is uh, was a sport that I didn't you know, know anything about. But I fell in love with baseball. And because I love baseball, I learned uh, to read. I wanted to read the newspaper, the Washington Post. Um, I fell in love with stats. So my love of baseball helped me learn English and math. Mm. Um, you know, and I'm now a, you know, a steward for the game. I take care of baseball in a number of ways. Mm. So um, I think what you love becomes um, your learning tool. Mm. And then uh, it also, you have an output on the other end. It's, it's something you serve. Mm. Um, and so, you know, we elected to raise our kids the same way. And we didn't get this out of any parenting book. There's tons of parenting books out there. Mm. We just paid attention. Like, okay, this makes sense. Um, and um, so our, um, our s- like our older son uh, loves playing music. He's a musician. Um, you know, he was uh, five and change. Um, and uh, so you know, I, I I play music too, but I'm a total hack. I, I learned late, um, but I love playing. So even though I'm average, I've played in bands my whole life, multiple bands, and mm-hmm. we play for love and we play for friendship. Mm. So I belong to multiple bands now too, um, and so you know he would see us play and he would ask for, um, you know, to to learn how and uh, and uh, you know we told him, I mean later um, when when you can actually hold these instruments because you're so small, you're mm. five years old, right? Guitar is like massive. So um, he went on YouTube and started teaching himself. So in six months, he ended up learning four instruments fluently and had perfect pitch. We had no idea he had perfect pitch. Um, I don't know if he was born with it or he cultivated it, but he would literally name doorbells, um, which I didn't think anything about until my dad said, he actually looked at it, that actually is an E-flat, that doorbell. Um, 
and you know he, within months he was like he got into a place where he could listen to a song and play all four instruments wow in that song wow um so we just you know he created a little studio we closed the door we opened it up and next thing you know he's a he's a musician um and he attributes it to his love of music and through it he's learned about technology mm. he's learned about history mm. uh, he's learned about uh, computers mm. um, and he's learned about travel he's been all over uh, he's learned about the media world so love was the the kernel mm. and the education came out of that love um, and then you know here's a t- caretaker of music I mean he does music and he and his band uh, the band's called WJM it's um uh, you know they are a, a 501c3 they're a foundation so mm. they they play for fun and they play music for the people um, you know I mean the people do um, offer to pay them but all the money goes to uh, they direct it to charities, charities of their interest and uh, they've had a remarkable time I mean they um, they've been able to have a regular childhood Mm. Um, you know, but, but they've been on national TV. They've been on NBC. Um, wow. Uh, they've been on um, national TV in Europe. Mm. Um, they played a lot of um, you know great gigs for great people, a lot of corporate mm. gigs, uh, and for foundations. But it's always been you know they're they're a non-commercial band. You can't um, you know you can't download their music. I mean, you can stream their music, but there's nothing for sale. Not for sale is kind of their. Um, their format. They've mm. also played at Burning Man <laughs> at Center Camp. They played. You brought your case for Burning Man. Oh yeah, yeah. Like, we could talk about it. Larry Harvey uh, was instrumental and in helped me re- reimagine uh, Burning Man. Mm. Um, but back to love, right? and they also picked up golf clubs uh, a few years ago on a surfing trip. Mm. Um, I'm one of the few hedge funders that doesn't play golf. Um, mm-hmm. And um, I took them to the driving range only because um, the, sh- the waves are flat. And uh, it was in Kauai. It was sunset time, downhill. Uh, everything they hit went a mile. Um, and somebody happened to say something nice as uh, the person was walking by. I could tell the boys who took notice. And they instantly fell in love with the game. And they haven't put down the golf club since. So both of them mm-hmm. play a ton of golf. Mm-hmm. Self-trained, exactly the same thing as music. Uh, very organic um, you know I've, I've had parents approach me and say how do you get guys how'd you guys get your kids to pick a golf like we never did mm. um, well how do I get my kids to play golf well I mean the other way I think about it is what do your kids love to do build mm. around that rather than how do I get them in the golf we never mm. tried to get them to do anything mm. and through golf they've learned unbelievable things mm. um, like what you know for instance to me um, Silicon Valley life is too fast mm. um, and uh, the value system is different than what I remember. Um, uh, I grew up in environments where people waved at each other with five fingers uh, <laughs> at inter- intersections. <laughs> and here people do wave each other with five fingers, usually in their neighborhood and when they get to mm, school. Mm. But then in between those places, they wave at each other with four fewer fingers. Mm-hmm. Um, I've never seen that before. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, I've never heard the word community before until I came to Silicon Valley. And the fact that people talk about it all the time tells me they don't have it. To me, community just was. Mm-hmm. There's no reason to talk about it. So the more I hear the word community, the more I feel the lack of it. I feel like people don't have it. Mm-hmm. Um, so we always imagine going back to home, right? Whatever. Mm-hmm. I mean, home as a metaphor, where people are kind to each other. Mm-hmm. There's the right pace. Um, people are part of something bigger mm-hmm. than their own lives um, and I, I love Silicon Valley for so many reasons um, um, you know but the value system is different than ours mm-hmm. well lo and behold and by the way we actually even house hunted um, uh, elsewhere um, we've looked at a lot of places um, And uh, one of the great things about Silicon Valley in California and the Bay Area that people don't talk about 
um, is the lack of mosquitoes. Like all these other places I visited, I completely forgot about the mosquitoes. I blocked it out. You know, you can't do anything in the summertime outside at night because of mosquitoes. California doesn't have mosquitoes. So, um, you know, we're not able to move to uh, places with, uh, you know, where there's just people just are and it's just deep community. So, um, we're like, okay, well, let's figure out how to live the lives that we want, mm. the slow life in Silicon Valley. Um, but you know where we found it is in the game of golf. As these mm. kids play golf, I had no idea that golf has the following attributes. Mm. Uh, golf is all about making sure others go first. Mm. Interesting. Yes. I don't play golf. So yeah, I had no idea. Me. I had yeah, no idea. Me. So that's the foundational culture is uh, making sure others go first. Constant paying attention to the, the path of others mm. instead of your own path. In fact, um, you can't even step in each other's lines. You have to not only anticipate the order, but you have to anticipate that you don't stand in the line of where they're going to putt. Mm. It's called not stepping in each other's lines. So this constant deference to others mm. is what we want out of life. And in golf, it's got embedded in their culture. Mm. Yeah, and then there's other things like you're off of your phone for hours. Um, you know, people tend to be outdoors you know, mm. a lot. Um, you do something for a long period of time instead of everything being a constant distraction. You're focused on a single thing. Um, you know, respect is a, a central value system. Mm -hmm. Self-regulation, um, where um, you know you're not. There's not a carrot or a stick governing you. You just—it's all by internal volition mm -hmm. um, that you learn what is right and wrong and you execute them. So. Who had any idea? We had no idea. Mm -hmm. But all these things just came from letting them do what they love. Mm -hmm. um, and people say, well, if you do let people do what they love, they might do something that's non-productive. We never managed to whether it's productive or not. So you don't even tell them productive or non-productive, things like that? Um, not per se. So, mm -hmm. you know, for me too, I was, uh, I was not raised that way. Mm -hmm. um, my parents gave me enormous freedom. They gave me a running room. and. You know, because I love baseball, they let me, <laughs> you know, uh, spend a lot of time with baseball. I mean, I ended up uh, collecting baseball cards, calculating stats, reading all these baseball books, memorizing stats. Mm. They never told me I couldn't do it. They just knew I loved it and they smiled and um, they had just this inner confidence mm. that it's going to be okay. Mm. Um, and of course, through that, I loved, you know, I fell in love with English and fell in love with math and I uh, started um, really getting into math. Mm. <laughs> you know, all that came as an epiphenomenon of my love of baseball. Mm. Um, so it's interesting because um, when I tell the story, I often hear from people, yeah, it's all about passion. I'm like, and it stops me in my tracks. I never said passion. Mm. I said love. Mm. What's the difference? I know. So people are like, what's the difference? Like, to me, passion and love are very different things. Oh, okay. Uh, passion is something you have. Passion is something you have. Okay. And love is something you bestow. Say a little bit more. Love is something you bestow. You bestow love. Mm. Passion is a noun, and it's something you have. Love is a verb, mm. and it's something you bestow on others. So um, at the end of your life, are you the sum of what you have mm -hmm. or are you the sum of what you did? Okay. You're the sum of what you did, right? Mm -hmm. So I think nouns are very different than verbs. Verb is something you act upon others and the world. Mm. Nouns are things and things you have and very sedentary. Mm. So when you say you had a love for baseball as an example, how do you bestow? I love baseball. I love baseball. So uh, I... You know, I spoke at the Major League Baseball meeting. I see. Um, you know, I do, I do some things for baseball, um, which is an honor. I mean, mm. um, because I felt like I was a huge beneficiary of the game. There's all this intangible value built into the air mm. um, that I became a part of. And, you know, I'm, I'm giving back as much as I can to the game. I see. So love has a component of giving back to whatever it is. Well, it's a noun. I'm sorry, it's a verb. And it's about you. It's not about me. Passion mm -hmm. is about me. 
It's about my journey. Mm. Love is about you. So you would never say to your child at night when you put in the bed, I have a passion for you. <laughs> you would just say, I love you. So to me, mm. passion and love are almost opposite things. Mm. Thank you for that distinction. It's a new, new way of thinking at it, about it. Mm. It's been something that I've leaned on heavily. So now when you, you can now rethink about one's life mm. because falling in love with the world is what kids do best. In fact, they fall madly in love with the world. Mm. So it's not like we have to design that in. Mm. It's actually intrinsic. We got to get out of the way. Mm. We just got to get out of the way. Falling madly in love with the world is what people do best. So you can think about life stages of the following. Childhood is a time you fall madly in love with the world. Mm. And then you enter your adolescent. That's the time you fall in love with the opposite gender. Okay. Um, so I didn't eat red meat growing up. My girlfriend, um, now my wife, loved red meat. So now I love red meat. Mm. Uh, so love was the reason why, I t because I loved her. The things that she loved, I took an interest in. Mm. And then you have kids and you love your kids and the things that they, be, they love become your interest. So I didn't know anything about golf, now I love golf. Mm. So we started asking our friends, my wife and I decided, um, you know, why don't we ask our friends what they love? Like mm. I've been to Berkeley many times and I didn't get it, but one of our friends loves Berkeley. Mm. So we asked her to show us her Berkeley mm. and it was intoxicating. When you're with people that love what they do, mm. that's love is the kernel that helps you engage. Mm. So the dominoes keep falling. You fall in love with the world when you're young, mm. and that becomes how you learn, and you become a steward for what you love. Mm. And then you love and fall in love with the opposite gender. Same thing, love is the kernel that expands mm. your, your platform and your experience. And then your kids expand. And then you start asking your friends, everybody, hey, you know, uh, I don't understand rock climbing. You love rock climbing. And when you're with people that love rock climbing, completely different experience. Mm. Thank you so much. I think this is the reason why I love doing this podcast so much. Because it allowed <laughs> me the lenses of seeing people's like love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they so generously share their point of view with, with me and the audience. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So perfectly said. Thank you. Well, no, thank you. And, um, and I think you're in the flow of people that are doing this. So you're probably learning more than oh, any I, one of us, right? Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Every time I talk to someone, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's great. I love that point of view, yeah. so thank you. you know, you're also a great listener, right? Asking questions and listening is what it's all about. Mm. Um, you know, we've, uh, my wife and I, um, you, know, you know, we end up doing a lot of relationship hacks that we kind of make up. Packs? Hack. Hacks. Hacks. <laughs> Life hacks, right? But we don't think about it as hacks. We just, it just, those things are things that we end up doing just by paying attention in a moment. Mm. Can I share with you a, uh, um, a story? Um, we were having lunch at our 15 year anniversary, on our 15 year anniversary. It was at like Calafia. And then we had our second major misunderstanding. During lunch? During lunch. During yeah, lunch, yeah, okay. okay. During lunch, misunderstanding. Mm. Um, you know, feeling uh, feeling really great uh, about her and the relationship. Um, and I think about the relationship as his own being. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, we actually celebrate, we took our uh, marriage out for drinks on uh, 21st anniversary, for instance. <laughs> right. Why so, you drink to your marriage? Well, we, because the relationship was 21 years old, mm. when on our 21st anniversary, we took it out drinking. Oh, <laughs> that's so funny. I love that. Just, it's a metaphor. So yeah, at no, 15 year, um, yeah. we're celebrating our relationship. Mm. And um, we marveled at um, the growth. Um, and, um, you know, and again, metaphorically, it's like, you know, our relationship has done a 10x. So for instance, when we were born, she didn't want kids, mm. or she wasn't sure about kids, and now she's a great mom. Mm. Um, we knew nothing about California when we were married, and now we live in California. So unimaginable things have happened to our relationship mm. uh, the first 15 years, 10x. So I made a pitch, a proposal, like you're saying, um, about uh, the next 15 years. Mm. I said, hey, uh, Hanny, let's do a 10x again the next 15 years. Mm. Um, what she heard was something else. 
Um, so I recommend not saying that to your, your wife. Oh, okay. Like, can we do a 10X? Because what she heard is there's something wrong. <laughs> like, uh, what, what's wrong with the brother, right? right? That's not how I meant it, but that's mm. standard miscommunication. Language is hard, right? There was a complete disconnect. So I had to dig myself out of that hole. Um, How'd you do that? No, we laughed our way through it. Oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> all right. Nicely done. Um, and then we got back, and then we got in the work mode. Like, okay, so let's, uh, let's improve our relationship. Um, 10x mm. let's come up with some ideas so um, she made this incredible proposal she said you know relation in relationships feedback doesn't work mm-hmm. we give each other feedback because we love each other we hope the behavior improves and we hope to be loved more for giving the feedback what actually happens is the behavior never changes and they resent you mm. I'm like oh my god that's genius feedback doesn't work so I'll, I'll say to Kimberly hey Honey, can you not put that there? It's going to fall over. What she might hear is, oh, I'm not good enough. Mm. Or maybe she'll tell me, hey, June, can you um, not leave your underwear on the floor? What I hear is you're a lazy slob. Mm. So we hear things that aren't being said. We hear judgment, uh, and we respond with resentment, mm. and the behavior doesn't improve. So like that's genius, no feedback. So we uh, tried to give each other that feedback. Turns out that doesn't work either. That doesn't work. Doesn't work. Okay. Because things are falling over, underwear is piling up. She comes back and says, time out, time out, time out. This no feedback thing doesn't work. Um, let's actually give each other feedback under one condition. Mm. It's got to be hilarious. Oh, okay. And a light bulb went off because I can tell you mm. that the most important skill in a marriage is being funny. Mm. It's definitely the most important skill during dating. In school, in professional life, in term sheet negotiation, in diplomacy, and schools completely forgot to teach us how to be funny. How do you be funny? Exactly. In fact, the conventional wisdom is that it can't be taught. Mm. Now, I like getting involved in situations like this where there's a consensus view. Mm. And most of the time, the consensus is right. Mm. I don't get involved in any things that are 50-50, by the way. Because to me, it's 50-50. Um, number one, I'm, I'm happy there's so many eyeballs on it. It also probably means they're both half right, even though they feel like they're 100% right. I'm more interested in things that are 100 to 0 or 99 to 1. Because mm. most of the time, the majority is right. But when the minority is right, is when there's transformation. Mm. So we decided we're gonna test the idea that humor can't be taught um, by investigating people that believe it's teachable. So we cold called Bats Improv and uh, asked them to make us funnier and they thought that was the funniest thing they ever heard. <laughs> 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 they invited us uh, to join them and we started doing it. Oh, you did improv? Yeah, we started doing improv, Amazing. right? And uh, first of all, it's incredible being around people that love improv. Yeah, yeah. Because it's the easiest possible thing. Yeah. Um, because they're so good, they tee you up. So what, whatever you're meant to say is the most obvious funny thing. Yeah. So just like with anything else, it's incredible being with people that love what they do. Uh-huh. But we learned something really important. At least I did. Uh-huh. Um, so when you ask professional improvisationist why they're sweating they say 99% of the sweat is this one thing Uh can you guess what that is Uh, excitement okay that's probably some of it yeah I mean nervousness maybe it could be nervousness what are they nervous about that um, maybe the other improvers in players wouldn't like get the ball they drop maybe they drop the baton or something maybe I don't know or maybe they wouldn't get the laugh right as a yeah, comedian because yeah. part of my understanding of being a comedian is you're being vulnerable and you, okay. you hope that yeah people now, get now we're it. talking now we're talking you know um so it actually wasn't anxiety they described they mm. described it as work work yeah the sweat was from work oh interesting and the sweat was they say 99 percent sweat was because it is almost impossible to ever hear what another human being is actually saying we're almost never listening mm. and in in regular life you can get away with not listening but in improv because the stories are built one person at a time mm. if you don't listen the story dies on you mm. so what I learned doing improv was I could follow anybody on stage except my wife because mm. every time I follow my wife I could see her lips moving and I couldn't hear what she was saying mm. turned out after 15 years I was listening selectively mm. You know, most of the time we're thinking about a repartee 
uh, we're thinking about you know our turn to speak listening is actually almost impossible mm. it takes active listening is really hard especially if you're in a set of patterns so being married 15 years mm. but I didn't realize the most important thing is I didn't realize I wasn't hearing her mm. I thought I was listening it was mm. hubris it was mm. ego it wasn't until I did improv that I realized I wasn't hearing her wow so when you realize you're not hearing somebody your ears pop instantly mm. you what? your ears pop it's like when you get your off a plane pop. your ears pop you didn't realize you couldn't hear until your ears pop you know something you can hear mm. so all of a sudden doing improv I could hear instantly. Mm. So when you can hear your spouse, your relationship do a, will do a 5x right there. So instantly, here we are on a you know, 10x return on our relationship. Already, we're, we're on our way. Thank you for that. That's actually uh, quite different. I've never heard a relationship hack by doing improv. Yeah. No, I, that's I, beautiful. <laughs> I love that. Whoever's listening, you know, take notes. You know, and the thing about improv is... Um, you can throw improv parties. Mm. Uh, number one, there's no prep. Nothing has happened yet. I would encourage people to go watch improv shows. There's no reviews of it because it hasn't happened yet. You know, so Hamilton's great. Uh, you know, but the tickets are like incredibly expensive. Um, and there's never been a review. Improv, nothing has happened yet. So to me, it's like super exciting. Mm. You don't know what's going to happen. Mm. Uh, and the tickets are typically very inexpensive. It's very affordable. Mm. Um, so go watch a show, t- you know, you can read books. The, the best improv book is a non-bestseller, which tells you everything you need to know about the world, right? It's an incredible skill, and no one's reading the books or, you know, writing the books. Um, so it's all upside. I what, mean, right, what's the name of the book? That you were everything is an offer. Everything is an offer. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Mm. And uh, there's multiple editions. And um, anyway, um, so... Uh, and then there's other attributes of improv that will be covered in the book, you know, mm-hmm. such as accept all gifts, but also you work hard to tee others up, mm. uh, to your earlier point, um, and um, idea of shared control, mm. share of distributed power. Mm. Uh, I just, uh, I was on a um, retreat with um, the Burning Man executive team, and, you know, they asked me to speak, so the topic I spoke on uh, was suzerainty. A what? Exactly. Suzerainty, my one of my favorite words. Suzerainty, suzerainty. Okay, I have no idea what you just said. That's what I love about it. It's all yeah. upside, right? Uh-huh. Suzerainty is um, from a linguistic taxonomy perspective. It's on the same order as sovereignty, which mm. you know, everybody knows. Sovereignty is mm. uh, command and control, power. Mm. Uh, suzerainty um, is in the same category, but it means something completely different. Mm. Suzerainty is the idea of decentralized power. Mm. Decentralized autonomy. I'm probably interpreting it for my own convenience. Mm. Uh, Suzerainty is the idea of distributed autonomy. Suzerainty is hoarding of power. I think about Suzerainty. Sovereignty is hoarding of power. Suzerainty is decentralizing power. Mm. Um, That to me is the foundation of Burning Man's success. Mm. I think it's the basis of a lot of good things. Mm. Um, it's a foundational concept. And the fact that no one is aware of it tells you everything you need to know. Mm. <laughs> um, but improv has that built in. You know, mm. it's, a, it's a shared control, decentralizing power. Mm. Instead of telling your own story, it's about the story of others mm. or shared stories. Man, you dropped so many gems so far. I don't, there's so many ways I can um, ask a follow-up question. I'm so curious. Um, but mm-hmm. let me hold my question. Would mm-hmm. you like to try the tobacco from Mongolia? Oh, thank you. I, um, I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Um, I literally have done nothing. Uh, I'm a big fan of the general idea. Mm-hmm. But um, um, and maybe one day. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> oh, so right now you're a purist. You don't. Is in I'm nothing. not really sure I'm purist, but um, you know I haven't. You know I. I'm kind of a homebody. I do okay. very few things. Okay. Um, I go deep, but I'm pretty a la carte. Okay. Um, 
and, uh, and I kind of do what makes sense to me day to day, minute to minute. Okay. And so that's how I live. <laughs> so okay. I never really thought about it. Um, other than I think it's um, a wave is coming, right? I think it's um, uh, it's helping a lot of people medically. So I'm mm -hmm. curious um, about the potential of a lot of the stuff becoming more mainstream. Mm -hmm. um, um, and the powers that it brings. I do think that we're connected to nature in ways that people don't realize. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, I think there's a lot there in terms mm. of relationships that we could have with, you know, beyond the animal kingdom, mm. you know, with the plant kingdom and elsewhere. Okay. Would you like to look at it or smell it? Sure. Okay, cool. So, that way, get a little historical or context. Mm -hmm. um, so Has Buddha tried any? Uh, I will tell you in a moment, actually. <laughs> Buddha has not tried this one. So this is uh, tobacco from Mongolia. So uh, culturally speaking, they use this kind of like a handshake. So instead of doing a handshake, they pass you their stuff tobacco, and you mm -hmm. put it on the back of your hand, and you smell it. And you, like, sniff it. Mm -hmm. This is a snuff. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, meant to be very minty, if you like to mm -hmm. take a look or smell it a little bit. Wow. Strong. Yeah. Flavors. I don't want to spill this. Oh yeah. So, so, so I'm sorry. So Mongolian. How old is that tradition? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I actually haven't investigated. Okay. Honestly, and then, so then what? What is your it. experience of it? This the mm -hmm. experience of this. Mm -hmm. So my wife is a Mongolian, mm -hmm. and uh, this is something that especially uh, his father actually bought me this bot. Her father actually bought me um, this bottle. My experience of it is just it's a very minty. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, very grounding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. it smells great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's it. And what about the other one? Um, sure. Happy to share that with you as well. So this is uh, what they call hape. It's also tobacco mixed with, uh, but mixed with tree ash. Tree ash. Tree ash. And this is what the which what tree. Good question. I don't know the answer to that question. I think it's like proprietary. Well, it's well, secret. Yeah, I can smell it. I love the fact that there's no labels on it. <laughs> it's hape. And then what you do is you um, use a uh, applicator mm -hmm. to blow into your own nose. Mm -hmm. Or you have, can have another person serve you. Mm -hmm. And the physical effect is very similar to like a hard workout. You know how after a really difficult workout... Your body is spent, mm -hmm. but your mind has a moment of quietness, mm -hmm. a silence. Mm -hmm. That's what the effect is very grounding. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that's why they use it before they um, go into a hunt. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. non psychoactive, it's just, physi you know, just physiological mm -hmm. effect. That's it. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to say. <laughs> I feel like my um, puppy state. Puppy state. We can talk about puppy state a little bit. Mm. Puppy state, which is childhood. Mm. Um, uh, childhood is the bliss state. We're born in the bliss, mm. um, and then adulthood uh, is an age of providing for others. That's the way I kind of thought about stages mm. of life. Mm. Um, that's not the message we hear from Madison Avenue or from the media in general. Mm. Childhood is a time to prepare. Mm. And adult is the time you harvest. So, um, complete different axis. Mm. Uh, and certainly children today are exposed to uh, an environment that is very oppressive. Mm. Uh, you know, I guess they call it education and they, they give it various different names, but um, it's certainly not a blue state. <laughs> that's, that's not what's being offered. Mm. What's being offered is work, preparation. Um, I think that builds resentment. If that's what you're told, and you come on the other side of it and you realize, oh no, that was supposed to be a bliss state, then you have this urge to get paid back. So I think it leaves mm. a huge hole. So when you talk about trauma, I can't imagine a bigger trauma than what kids are being asked to endure today. Mm. And um, I think that's a hole you never fill again. Mm. So I have actually a follow-up question around that. Uh, my mental model around all of this is I love the yin, the yang sign. Mm -hmm. So the yang to me represent intentionality. 
right? The, the yin represent to me surrendering, right? And then how do you hold the two together, right? In, in, in the black, there's a little bit of white. In the mm -hmm. white, there's a little bit of black, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you create harmony mm -hmm. as one or the other? I'm sorry, no, it's, it's not one or the other. It's actually holding both and mm -hmm. finding harmony in between. Mm -hmm. So everything that you said, so beautiful, is very counter to how I've been raised myself. Mm. In the Chinese, mm. Taiwanese. How were you raised? Tell me more. Right, in, a, in the Taiwanese uh, education system, uh, how I was raised as well. My parents very much uh, tiger parents. Mm. My mom especially, tiger mom, right? Mm. Very intentionality, mm. preparing for the future. Mm -hmm. Here's one way to do it, do it my way, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, education system very much the same way you go into a great junior high school you do well such that you can pass the entrance exam such that you can get into a great high school and you do that well and then you can get into uh, pass the entrance exam for college mm -hmm. da, 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 right such mm -hmm. that you can get a good job doctors lawyers a very prescribed way mm -hmm. very intentional way of doing it mm -hmm. um, where was I going with this right so everything that you share is very much to me, my, my, through my lens, is more of a surrendering, following you know, what you love and providing space for that versus uh, artificially guiding them towards a specific path. You're, you're starting from your grandpa to your parents to now you as a parent to your kids. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very inspired by it. Like I'm also curious to know what's your point of view around this other way, this like tiger mom, tiger parenting. Well, there's a role. Uh, yeah. I can see why it does uh, a lot of good too. Mm. Um, and, um, but the world needs people that grow up with different formats. Mm. You know, it, it's great to have uh, a cohort of people mm -hmm. um, that are only able to do things because they endured. Um, one more time, back up one sentence. Well, they're they're resilient, right? So mm -hmm. they've been um, uh, they've been asked, in some cases, forced to uh, do a tremendous amount of academic labor. Mm -hmm. um, so whereas I have no resilience. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I actually was never potty trained, um, mm. being kind of a farm boy. Mm. So I have no sphincter tone. Um, <laughs> so I have, uh, you know, I have no patience. Now people say, Junior, you know, patient investor, um, you've quit nothing, you've had one job, one marriage. Um, well, that's because people don't see the fact that I quit everything instantly. You know, so to me, not having resilience is a core life skill. Mm, um, interesting. I feel like resilience, I'm glad people are resilient, uh, and I'm glad many people are resilient. Um, and it's good to have diversity. I, I love having people that are non-resilient. Mm. Um, especially at a time when the value of time is inflating faster than any other asset class. Time is inflating like crazy. It's so valuable. Uh, the inhibited quit, I think, is causing tremendous harm. Um, so I would love to promote the idea of quitting uh, and bring it to the level of failure. Failure used to be a very negative word, and now it's a very positive word in education. It's okay to fail. Mm -hmm. I feel like people should be okay with quitting. Um, mm. Right now, quitting has a very negative brand. Mm. Like, uh, probably the only thing positive associated with the word quit is smoking. Mm. Uh, but otherwise, quitting is there's pressure against it. Um, there's a correctness about not quitting. And I get that, right? Um, sometimes it's good to not quit. But sometimes it's good to quit. Right. So I think the brand is overdone. I see. Not quitting. Mm. So um, I think quitting is an enormous skill. And I mm. quit things instantly. And that's why I quit nothing, because I quit enough things, I actually find enough time to find the things that I love. Mm. So a lot of people by age 40, they say, well, I, I don't love what I do, and I don't know who I deal with. I'm like, oh my God, if those were the two most important criteria, what were you doing? Like, well, I thought if I did this, this, and that, I would be happy. Mm. So I, I endured, I was resilient, mm. and now you're, I'm resentful, right? Mm -hmm. So um, for me, like, I, I've only finished one book in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and so you read a lot, but you quit a lot of the time. My mind just leaves. Mm. I can't stay on track. Mm. Uh, to me, uh, authors are authoritarian. Mm. Um, it's kind of tyranny. I have to stay with their words. I mean, you get some wiggle room inter interpretation, but I have to stay on their path. And maybe I want to take my own path. Mm. So I put a book down. 
I might skip ahead, I might go back, I might put it down, pick it up years later. Mm. Um, uh, I only finished one book, it was Watership Down, and I thought it was about rabbits, and they told me it was about government, I'm like, I completely missed it. <laughs> um, but I read a ton, uh, I, l I love reading, I love writing. Um, but some things are just impossible to get through. I remember the first time I saw a book, um, a friend of mine was in law school, I'm like, after two paragraphs, I'm done. I can't do this. And thank God people are resilient. Mm. They can read through that. and become lawyers because mm. we need them. Mm. And thank God it's not me. Right. Yeah. So I'm not able to survive those kind of endurance tests. But it's because I quit those things instantly. I'm able to create the space, the running room, right. uh, to do things that I love. Mm. Going back to the theme that we've kind of been talking about, right? Time is passing by so quickly within mm -hmm. blinks of eyes, right? Mm -hmm. You said 50 years, like that, mm -hmm. right? So within our lifetime, mm -hmm. within the limited amount of energy or you know, dedication to different projects or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. relationships, conversations, mm -hmm. how do you navigate who or what you want to spend your time on? Mm -hmm. Is it purely wide open lens yes do everything but you also quit very fast or how do you mm -hmm. how do you navigate yeah, that's an easy one so I, I spend time with people that have time mm. so what that means is um, because the value of time is inflating fast we have no upper bounds in terms of our standards mm. uh, so for instance sugar was rare in nature and now that it's abundant everybody's obese because mm. they can't say no um, same thing with time and opportunity. The value of time is rising so fast and people are, have more opportunities now than there's ever been possible in human history. People say yes to everything. Mm. And next thing you know, they're overscheduled, they're busy, they're actually struggling and they're stressed out. Correct. This is not supposed to be bad, right? Um, so uh, I've been coaching around this concept called opportunity obesity. Not oh, unlike not unlike caloric obesity. Because you don't know how to say no, you say yes to everything and now you've got a bloated schedule. Right. Um, and so there's several problems with being busyness. First of all, it creates a false sense of security that you're actually doing things that are valuable because right. you were busy. Right. The second thing is it gives you no room to pivot. So I have no competition on most things I do because no one's got the time. Like when I encounter something interesting, I could spend three days straight on it. Mm. There's no one I know that has three days straight. Mm. Whereas, because most people, if they kind of something interesting, they got to slot in their calendars, but they're booked out for two weeks. They have no time to pursue. Mm. Um, it's never been easier to get ahead when everybody's falling behind constantly. You just mm. have to s sit still and everybody keeps falling behind. Mm. So the, um, I think having an open schedule and valuing your time is super valuable. Mm. Now, um, so most people I know are overscheduled and are booked out for weeks. Like I've, I've always used my Microsoft Outlook as a diary rather than a calendar. I try to keep my calendar clear. Uh, so people will try to book out on my calendar a month in advance. So I tell them uh, people I can't do it this week. No, no, no. I can't book out a month either. The whole reason I'm available today is because I didn't pre-fill it a month ago. Mm. So I will now just schedule things tomorrow and I won't schedule things a month from now. Mm. I will, you know, I have this like one meeting a day, um, you know, rough rule of thumb. Um, that forces me to really think about what's the most valuable thing mm. to do that day. Mm. But then I'm busy all day. Mm. I'm on the phone, I'm reading, I'm catching up, I'm investigating, exploring. Mm. Um, so I, I use my Microsoft Outlook uh, as my diary of what I did rather than a planner of what I'm planning to do. Mm. So it's improv. And I, I enter into every day not knowing. Mm. But because I don't know, uh, I can listen better. I can hear better. I can mm. see things. And I got time to pursue. Now, mm. most people are booked out, like I said, you know, um, days, if not weeks. Mm. So you know, if I can use a financial or investing analogy. Let's do it. So most people are buying everything. That's why they're busy. Mm -hmm. They're overscheduled. Yeah. And if you say yes to everything, you're essentially buying the index fund of life. Mm. You buy the index fund, right? Whereas if you say no to almost everything, you know, like uh, I like to invest in very few things, mm. you know, maybe a dozen things, right? So I like concentrated portfolios. Mm. Now I think it's totally okay to buy everything because life is actually pretty grand. Mm. So if you buy the index fund of life, you're probably going to do pretty well. Just mm. say yes to everything and you'll do fine. Because the average life is pretty wonderful right now. Mm. 
Um, but if you want to have an extraordinary life, mm. you can't buy the index fund. I'm interested life. in that. Yeah. So how do you do it? Run it like a hedge fund, very concentrated, mm. do very few things, mm. force yourself to understand your priorities and your value systems mm. and try to live according to those. doesn't matter what you do. I'm not here to pre-design for people, but create your own running room for yourself. Give mm. yourself space. Mm. Uh, figure out, prioritize, curate down to very few things. Uh, and gently and kindly say no to everything. Mm. So what I end up doing is I end up associating with people that have capacity. Mm. I look for capacity. Can they do it today? Mm. So I'll, I'll often invite things. I'll throw parties and events or even request meetings same day. And uh, amazingly, my life has gone to the point where almost everybody I know can do things. You're surrounding yourself with people who have that capability That's who, to uh, say yeah, yes. I, to I ended up that way. Meeting. I ended up being in, um, in associated with people um, that have capacity mm. that I can go do things with, mm. short notice, um, unplanned. So it ends up being a filter. Mm. Now, some of the people are just between jobs, they're unemployed, that's why they have time. Mm. Other people just have chosen to live their life that way, like me, mm. Mm. Um, being really focused on a few things, mm. being selective. In a world of abundance, it's actually worth being selective. Mm. Mm. Um, and those are the people you can introduce stuff with. Whereas, if you associate with people that are busy, you're not going to get anywhere. Mm. They'll try to schedule out three weeks. Like, yeah, I love what you're doing. Let's schedule something. And then, you know, it's like you just go through these, all these emails and things. It's just no time. Mm. I love that. You know, there's a phrase that we hear a lot called... You know, the average, the five people that you spend the most time with. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously not deterministically, but, you know, generally it's a pretty good rule of thumb, right? Whether it be positive outlook, how they spend their time, what kind of, maybe your, your net worth, you know, all these other things. Um, how do you curate? So I, w I would love for you to kind of go th down that rabbit hole a little bit more. How do you curate the people that you, June, surround yourself with? Mm, you know, I, I tend to focus on people I like. And the reason for that is very easy. Mm. Um, if I like somebody, it brings out the best in me. I want to work harder for them. Mm. Um, so the best of me comes out um, when I like somebody. Mm. That's it? Yeah, yeah. If you Again, like them. the direction, right? So mm. to me, adulthood is a time to provide. Mm. And I know I can provide better mm. if I'm motivated and I like somebody. I want to go to the wall for them. So my orientation isn't what this person can do for me. Mm. The orientation is, what can I do for you? Wow. One way to live. Mm. You know, secretly, oh, and I'm sure this in public now, <laughs> I would love to be that person, right? I'm doing that with information, right? I'm, I'm good at helping and I'm like, oh yeah, say, you say something really beautiful, really profound, let me make sure that everyone else hear it. I'm that guy, right? But I love to be able to uh, to have the wherewithal to say, hey, this person needs help in this particular way, financially or otherwise, you know, socially, network-wise, or, you know, so-and-so that I know, to say, be that person and, like, open the doors for them. That's the kind of person. And it sounds like you're at that space right now. So mm -hmm. love to but, hear. But that's my only experience of you. First of all, I love the fact that you would love, right? So love. Um, and everything you do, the only things I see is you're providing for others. Mm. You provide for your audience. You provide for Buddha right now. Mm. Um, you have nothing but offerings. You know, you're providing uh, me an opportunity to share my story. Mm. Um, so you are already a provider. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Thank uh, you. Yeah. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. I, I don't feel like there's, uh, there's a search that you need to seek. It. It's like it's right here. You're doing your work. Mm. And it shows. Right? Mm. I mean, you can, when you're, I'm so glad we did this in person then rather than over the phone. Mm. Because it shows in your eyes, shows in your posture. Mm. Um, you know, you're providing. You know, you, and you've been doing it. Oh, thank you. I yeah. appreciate that. Hmm. Yeah, it sometimes it doesn't feel that way. Right? Sometimes I, we, I wish that there's more I could do. So, I mean, that's a, that's, that is one of the key insights, and I love the fact that you're making it all on your own. Mm -hmm. So, um, my first misunderstanding with my wife, mm -hmm. uh, we were 25 years old, 
And I went to medical school. I, I always went to school for the consumption value. I was never preparing. I love it. I did education a la carte because I loved it. Mm -hmm. I went deep. The things I cared about, I was surrounded by incredible teachers along the way, many of whom I sought out on my own. Um, um, so I was that crazy kid that went to medical school for the consumption value. I went it for the fun. Mm. <laughs> I thought it'd be amazing. Uh, I also thought it'd be funnier because, uh, you know, medicine has sex, poop, and death, which are the three, foundation of, the three foundations of humor. And they made medical school completely unfunny. <laughs> <laughs> so the way I survived medical school was uh, we had something called the back row club. There were 12, 12 of us. And we would re, well, actually, eventually the whole class started doing it. We would retell the lectures uh, written down in a funny way. We'd rewrite them. Mm. And humor is very engaging, right? So I actually learned through the crutch of humor. Mm. I couldn't wait to read the lectures provided by my friends <laughs> of what I was just taught. Uh, anyway, we had such a blast in med school. We all cried at graduation. That's the way it should feel. Mm. It shouldn't feel like it was endured. Right. Like a it should tour. feel like, yeah. oh my God, I'm going to miss this. Right? Mm. So I know the dean still talk about a class. We had so much fun. Now, um, so as we're getting near the end, I asked my girlfriend at the time, hey, honey, will you, um, after graduation, will you um, live with me in a trailer in Mexico? Mm. <laughs> And her telling me no changed my life. <laughs> really? Yeah. She said no. <laughs> she said no. Oh, okay. uh, and this is before Shawshank Redemption. I mean, there's, <laughs> this, there's this picture at the end of Shawshank where, you know, it ends with the word I hope. Mm. Um, and uh, um, Robbins, Timothy Robbins, mm -hmm. approaches, oh God, I'm forgetting the names of the actors, but it kind of pans away. Uh, that actually occurred after I said this to Kimberly. Like that was it was the same year. Um, Ninety four was the last year I stopped watching movies. You don't watch movies anymore. Oh, I love movies. I just I just forgot. I've not seen a movie since ninety four. Last wow. movie I saw was a Forrest Gump. Wow. I love movies. I just forgot. I'm no no more for what I don't do than what I do. I I love all these things. I just don't. I forget to do them. That's why I have so much free time. That's so interesting. <laughs> You, you selectively saying no to I don't movies. even say no I just forget to <laughs> oh wow that's fascinating anyway so I was Shawshank and so Kimberly telling me no had a profound impact on me because it was at that moment I realized because I loved her that she will depend on me or will depend on each other and there'll be kids and our parents are gonna grow old I literally in, um, I sat there and thought about the fact that I have an opportunity to provide mm. and the way you provide is from strength mm. and the way you get strong is to work hard. So I immediately started hustling. Mm. So for a student that was a la carte, mm. I became the total student after that because the desire to provide for others was the motivator mm. and that's the warrior mentality that's a noble warrior mm. so none of the messages got to me first 18 years or even 25 years this idea that I got to do it to harvest from myself none of that stuff appealed to me like I just I just kind of shrugged and said no mm. that, that's that's not that doesn't make sense to me right mm. but the idea of doing it for others was the motivator mm. And then after that, um, I haven't stopped. I haven't stopped since. Mm. This is deeply embedded in the human psyche, definitely the male psyche. We have this capacity. Mm. It tends not to be signaled to by media. Mm. We don't appeal to that side. And yet this is deeply ingrained into our DNA and architected in our psyche. I think that's the upside potential. That's what's coming. Say more about that, because actually, I, I kind of get it, but you lost me in the last sentence statement that you just made. Yeah. Um, I think deeply ingrained in the human psyche, and specifically in the masculine psyche, uh, is the instinct to provide mm -hmm. and to protect. Mm -hmm. um, and the th things that um, germinate from that 
is strength, right? So mm. um, when you have this orientation towards unconditional love of others, mm. um, the best way to do that is to be strong. And your strength is not what you have, it's what you think you have. So it's not like you gotta be rich in order to give others. Mm. It's always a matter of perspective. So there, it's worth now, there's a motivating factor to, be, to excel, to achieve, mm. to prepare, mm. um, because it's a service of somebody else instead of for yourself. Mm. I think that's just much more powerful. Mm-hmm. I think the narrative around doing it for yourself um, doesn't get you. It's limiting. Doesn't get you anywhere. Yeah. Doesn't get you anywhere. Yeah. So how does one? Okay, I'm 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 sold. Like <laughs> so I, 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 I'm not selling anything. I, I understand. I'm sorry. I'm inspired. Right. So people who are listening and inspired by this this narrative, this like ability to provide. Okay. How do they cultivate the strength? What? Okay. So let's yeah. get down to it on the tactical side a little mm-hmm. bit. <clears throat> so how does June, on a daily basis, cultivate his strength? his capacity mm-hmm. to provide yeah. for not only him and his spouse, him and his kids, but him and his community, right? All of it. So then you can kind of propagate outside of that sphere of influence. Mm, yeah. Well, so um, my primary focus is actually building the strength in others. Mm-hmm. Um, so, because what I'm interested in is now, so if you use this whole model, Mm-hmm. But what you're actually trying to do is, let's say, solve a problem or create an opportunity for the world, mm-hmm. then it's much better if you decentralize that power. Yeah. Um, rather than building one yourself up and be He-Man and trying to do something. Okay. Um, so there's a number of things one can do. And, you know, the, the Longevity Initiative, which, um, um, you know, we're helping support, um, instantiates that perspective. Um, uh, so the first thing is to really think about what leadership means I think leadership is um, probably the most misunderstood and possibly the most abused word uh, on the planet I mean there's I think I heard a number somewhere that there's been 900,000 plus books written on leadership Mm -hmm. and yet we're diffusely unhappy with our leaders in the Mm -hmm. private sector government public sector I think it's not the right word. Mm. I think what we're really asking for is stewards. We're not asking for leaders. Mm. And um, you know, we're asking for the wrong things. Uh, or you could decide to define leadership in a way. And there's infinite number of definitions of what leader is. To me, there's only one. Leadership is a creation of leaders, leading leadership of others. So if you're creating leaders and you're defining leadership as a creation of other leaders, it just keeps dominoing. Because mm. the leader creates another leader, that's the way you define it. Mm. So it keeps moving. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you define uh, a leadership or a market leader as how many followers you have, it ends there. Mm. It's a form of tyranny. Mm. So leadership as defined by followers is the path of darkness. Mm. Leadership as defined by the creation of other leaders mm. is a race to the top mm. of the world. Right? Um, so we're constantly looking for ways in all of our initiatives um, to shine the light on others and to distribute the power so they can, and they do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I was uh, recently on, a, um, on the Today Show, mm. the Megyn Kelly Show. Um, uh, you know, the Longevity Initiative has now um, attracted you know, a ton of people, talent, ideas, funding, attention um, because I think it's the most interesting um, problem worth solving it also gives you more time for everything else and we have a whole row of things that we want to help support the world in but longevity is a thing that unlocks the human capacity and the human potential so we front loaded that as the first Mm. uh, initiative Um, but uh, the the thing that has really worked well and same thing with the NBC show is I I, um, you know when I get a request for interview I um, I ask if I could bring a scientist on stage, mm. um, um, especially if it's a woman. Mm. Uh, number one, they're actually doing the work. Mm. Number two, by the time the interviewer talks to them, they're amazed how incredible they are, right? So it makes me look good to have referred them to somebody more powerful sure. and somebody who's actually doing the work. Mm. Um, and in this case, uh, Alyssa Apple also brought another scientist on stage. You can see how the dominoes roll. 
you know, um, the gift of the platform mm. and sharing the stage with others mm. is a self-replicating code. Mm. It's Suzanne It's distributing power mm. as a way to grow the movement. Mm. Mm. So if I look back on why did the, this field, um, in terms of how we are contributing, why, why does it feel like it's going so fast? It's because so many people are joining forces mm. and entering the stage and giving each other the stage. Um, that is a value system. This is your mm. I love that. Mm. So many ways, like, so, okay. So if someone is inspired, a leader of their own, Sorry, a steward mm-hmm. uh, of the own making. Right? <laughs> Good listener, see? Yeah. A steward of, actually, here's one thing I believe, spiritually speaking. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're a spiritual person. I feel, I feel that you are, but I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. But one of the, the downloads that I receive, actually, from Burning Man is nothing belongs to me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Everything that I experience is a blessing. Mm-hmm. And I'm merely a steward mm-hmm. of my talents, financial whatever right Mm -hmm. relationships everything so therefore I am intending to store and to empower Mm -hmm. others Mm -hmm. to live the best life that I can that I can help so hence why this desire Mm -hmm. to like if only I can do more right Mm -hmm. so going back to my question what was my question so someone who is inspired Mm -hmm. to do this Mm -hmm. store up their own making Tactically, how can they uh, take this on yeah. in their own you know, sphere yeah. of influence? Well, exactly. so I mean, being a verb, take, you know, so we really mm-hmm. focus on action rather than the ideas. Um, you know, I've uh, absorbed a lot of heuristics over the years. Um, uh, there are three that I, I, I think are the most valuable mm-hmm. the heuristics for me, mm-hmm. and. Uh, uh, you know, I can describe the projects I'm involved in through the lens of the three things. One is sure. to be a camera. Uh, number two is to aim high, aim at least 10x. Mm. And number three is to be a verb. Mm. Um, so what do, we, what, do I mean by, um, what do I mean by being a camera? So our, our brains are wired such that after age 12, um, our mind no longer acts like a camera. It starts acting like a projector. So rather than seeing what's there, Mm. we tend to project what we already believe. And this made sense in the Darwinian wild where the you know, median lifespan was, let's say, you know, mm-hmm. 20 mm-hmm. in the wild. So the form factor for your life, your life history is uh, be open to the world for about 12 years. Mm. Um, then Romeo and Juliet your way through romance. <laughs> Romeo and Juliet your way. Yeah, Juliet was, Julia was 13. <laughs> um, you know, in most cultures, 13 is when you start having babies. Yeah. We had no idea how Romeo was. And then you might have seven kids, half are going to die. In fact, half your siblings are probably dead. One of your parents are dead. Death was everywhere, right? Um, so being uh, alive and uh, in, in a bliss state for 12 years and then spending 12 years being a provider for others was mm-hmm. a perfect form factor. Mm-hmm. Now, we're not dying at 22 anymore. We're living though 50, 70, 100, 120. Right. So we still have this old factory setting that mm. um, nature gave us of being open to the world for 12 years, and then we spend 88 years being a projector. Mm. That to me is like not a good balance. Wouldn't it be nice if we could actually be open-minded? You know, you can't learn languages after 12 because you never hear the language again. Mm. You're never listening again. You're seeing what you want to see, hearing what you want to hear after 12. Um, so as a function of that, you give up so much opportunities. So much of what I'm doing is so obvious. In retrospect, mm. but prospectively, if you say I didn't see it, mm. I didn't see it. Uh, in fact, inability to see this as the biggest opportunity is a symptom of the fact that people can't see. The fact that people haven't seen this, the fact that we should extend the period of openness biologically. Mm. Don't let it under twelve. Why don't we uh, come up with a solution, innovate in a way that increases our neuroplasticity? Mm. You know, for fifty years. Mm. Um, but the fact that people haven't s- even seen this as a problem exemplifies a problem people mm. have just closed off so almost everything we're working on from a project perspective 
uh, I think are just obvious. They're mm -hmm. stating the obvious. It's mm -hmm. the elephants, you know, roaming around everywhere that people can't see. Mm -hmm. So be a camera. Let mm -hmm. yourself be a camera again, like the first 12 years when you can see. Mm. doesn't require more education. It actually requires listening. We talked about how impossible listening is. It requires seeing, mm. requires sensing, requires being present. Mm. Um, it requires just honoring what's actually going on and happening rather mm. than projecting our views. And as you've probably seen in social media, people love to project their views on others. Mm. Listening, almost zero. Mm. Or selective listening, usually as a weapon to use against the other side. So once the trust and respect is gone, it just becomes war games. Mm. Yeah. That's not interesting. The goal is not to fix that. The goal is to just focus on um, value, what is valuable, and what actually works, and what's helpful. Aiming high, aiming 10x. Um, so to me, most people aim too low, especially at, you know, by the time you hit 40 and you listen to your friend's plans, their expected return on life is way too low. Mm. So um, here's what 10x is. 10x is not 20%. So let's talk about what 20% return on life is. 20% return on life means you're trying to do what you're doing and doing a little better. Mm. You, can just do, you can just work hard to optimize the path you're on. So at 40, most people I know know who they're going to be with, what they're going to do, where they're going to retire. Mm. Whereas a 10x return at age 40 is completely different. Mm. Who do you know that's aiming 10x at age 40? You're not even 40 yet, so you probably don't have friends. I'm 40, 40, actually. Are you? Mm -hmm. You look good. <laughs> <laughs> not bad. <laughs> so um, Everyone that I interview. Okay, mm -hmm. there you go. You're, you gotta, see, you're, you're selecting your group, right? And you're doing it through a network of trust. Mm -hmm. I'm in this meeting because I trust Gil. Mm -hmm. You're in this meeting because you trust Gil. Mm -hmm. And this is a great way um, to navigate through your day and your life. Mm -hmm. So I worry that people aim way too low. Because the problem with aiming too low is that you get there. If you're looking for a 20% return, Getting a person return to me is a catastrophe because mm. if you're aiming 10x, you could fail and still get a 3x. Mm. Uh, the second problem with aiming too low is that everybody's looking for low returns. It's competitive. You're probably not even going to get there. Very Whereas noisy. nobody wants high returns. Yeah. So you're more likely to <laughs> get a high return mm. than a low return. Uh, the problem with low returns is that it, people become dividers. When the stakes are low, the only way to get a larger piece of the pie is to take from others. It's a zero-sum game attitude that comes mm. from low aims. Mm. Whereas if you have high aims, your smaller piece of the pie, of a growing pie, is still larger. So it, it tends to induce collaborations. Mm. Um, the next thing is, in order to get a 20% return, you can get there through linear thinking. You can kind of plan out, you know, draw lines. Well, linear thinking means you can see all the way through to the end, to your, mm -hmm. to your grave. Mm -hmm. Whereas in order to do 10x thinking, you have to do compound thinking. Compound thinking is you have to think in curves. Mm. And the thing about curves is you can't see through to the end. So right. life remains a mystery even at age 40 mm. rather than seeing all the way through to the end. Mm. So it's much more fun. Mm. How do you do that actually? So, so a couple of follow-up questions. Well, one, what does the extraordinary life look like? I'm curious to know. Self-defined. So okay. uh, the way I think about, for instance, um, you know, my friends mm -hmm. is... I listen to their views of what extraordinary life is, not my views. Mm. Um, and I listen to how they live against it. Mm. So I don't think there's, uh, everybody's on their own. Um, they have their own perspectives and I decentralize that power in terms of defining those things to them. Well, I'm asking you. For me? Right, yeah, yeah, for you. Because you know, I wanted to, well, selfishly speaking, get some ideas from you, right, perhaps. Well, so to me, <laughs> to me, the extraordinary life today is the ordinary life. Um, so I think ordinary has turned into the new extraordinary because everybody's chasing the extraordinary. Um, so I, I, I focus on the most banal things. In fact, banality to me is my favorite subject. I give lectures on banality. In a world where um, uh, people are motivated to present to, to you sensationality and extraordinary, uh, when everything is clickbait, from information to food to all sorts of signals, people are swimming the extraordinary. And because everybody is focused on extraordinary, the ordinary has been left behind. No one is looking at the ordinary. Okay. So I think ordinary is the most extraordinary thing going on. So the things that I'm interested in, there's mm. nobody. The denominator is like literally zero. Mm. Um, well, can you give me a, a co so concretize that? What would be an example of that? 
my 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 favorite plant is grass, not the rose. Rose to me is famous because it's extraordinary. But to me, that's botanical porn. Our minds are drawn to porn. Mm. I like things that are ubiquitous. Mm. I like things that are everywhere. They're telling us something. Mm. Why are they so robust? Mm. Um, you know, people love to look at tropical fish. I like the bristle mouth. There's qu quadrillion of them. They're so successful. They're everywhere. Mm. When they're everywhere, you can't see them. Mm. But it tells me why they're so successful. Why are they everywhere? Things that are ubiquitous are the things that we lose sight of. Mm. But in fact, those are the most extraordinary things. So the ordinary mm. is the new extraordinary. Mm. They're everywhere. Mm. Um, and as it turns out, there are ordinary things everywhere. Mm. Um, you know, if you can slow down your mind and just slow down in general, if you got capacity, mm. I think the ordinary just pops out. Um, so all the projects we're doing are just completely ordinary and straightforward and banal mm. nothing crazy about them it's like the most normal thing mm. like the fact that the, the medical system wasn't trying they were trying to solve everything but aging in retrospect I mean now that longevity and aging has um, really grown in terms of public interest. In retrospect, it's obvious. Prospectively, you couldn't convince anybody mm. that aging was a problem worth solving. I got so much um, negative feedback mm. about being interested in this as a, a large-scale problem. Mm. It was almost definitionally true because if they thought it was great to pursue, maybe they would have done it. But they had already decided in their mind, this is not worth doing and it can't be done. So it was all upside. <laughs> So how do you train yourself, once again, right, I'm inspired by the way you think about things. And almost, um, to me, have you ever heard a uh, Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu? Mm, I have not. Please so, tell me. Uh, it's just like, he's the founder of Taoism, the yin yang sign actually came from him, mm, uh, mm. very much. Um, um, everything you said very much in line. I'm, I'm going to do a terrible job explaining his philosophy, but he essentially says everything, life unfolds naturally. And it's the best way to live it is by allowing yourself to be, to, to ride the wave, to, 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 to identify what's already that's happening. So mm -hmm. focus on the, the infinitesimal, um, the lesson that's within, you know, and and, and doing a terrible job about, about explaining him, but, but about allowing no, you're doing great. You're your, doing great. Your, your, yourself to, to mm. be part of it rather than trying to exert that sovereignty, that mm. human will to make mm. something happen. Mm -hmm. He basically just like, life is already happening. Everything's beautiful. Very mm -hmm. much a Vipassana equanimity way of looking at life. Mm -hmm. So I really mm. appreciate that. Yeah, I think uh, what I'm hearing there is, I mean, letting it be... Um, you know, there's a desire to leave a dent, and um, but if if one has a faith in the future, mm -hmm. that um, you know the world was great when we arrived, it'd be great when we leave. Mm -hmm. There isn't this anxiety that you got to leave a dent in the universe. Why would you want to dent? Mm -hmm. That feels like hubris to me. Like the desire for impact. Mm -hmm. Impact is denting, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a really a rebellion against fear and death. Mm -hmm. Um, is trying to leave a mark but if you think that the world is was is and will be beautiful uh, there isn't that anxiety that you gotta create this deformity mm. called a dent and leave an impact so how does one train oneself because it's extraordinary to think 10x our brain is designed to think linearly Right. How do you, yeah. how do you <laughs> tactically when, when yeah. we well, bring we're back inborn. Tactical? We're inborn with uh, compound thinking. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm helping contribute to a book on this concept. Um, uh, there's only two populations left in the world that can do compound thinking. Because, you know, we, uh, math essentially ruined our ability to do compound thinking. Math is great at linearity. Mm -hmm. The math that we've all been exposed to 
is the linear math. It's the Sumerian, Mesopotamian, Chinese, Cartesian math. Um, it's called linear scaling. Uh, in the real world, it's all about compressive scaling. Um, I wrote an essay, 2008-2009, about this, because I'm just blown away how people can't do compound thinking. And I think it's because of math. I think math does tremendous brain damage. Linear math. Mm. Now, linear math is important. You need um, linear scaling if you're trying to hit a rocket to the moon. Um, but that's a rare case, use case. Most things occur through recursion, so you need compound thinking. And uh, people can't do compound thinking, so they keep drawing straight lines. Like calculus does, tells you nothing about a curve except that point in time. It is very weak at helping describe compounding phenomena. Mm. Uh, I'm not saying we should ban math. I mean, it does a lot of good, uh, but it's good for transactions. But it's not good uh, to understand life. Mm. So the two people that can do compound thinking are Aborigines and preschool children before math. Mm. And then we crush it out of them. Yeah. So, so in other words, it's not something to be discovered. Mm. It's actually part of your bliss state. Mm. Well, how, how do we unlearn that and actually <laughs> go back to, right? Because how do we undo math? Well, undo, undo, unlearn these training that we get from our formal education system. I'm actually a product of our formal education yeah, system. Yeah. Right, the, so. the best thing to do is just to pay attention. If you look at nature and phenomena, mm. um, it's all there. It's all compounding. So the best way to unlearn is to just be present instead of projecting our views, the deep listening that you're doing. And, you know, when you're listening, it tells you it, 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 it's all there for you. And it always was there. Mm. Um, it's embedded in, in, um, in everything. Mm. It's in the ordinary. Compound thinking is in the ordinary. Mm. You know, one of the gems uh, Gil dropped during his uh, interview with me, he said, uh, uh, he encourages entrepreneurs to think probabilistically. Mm -hmm. And today you share, you know, think, think compound thinking. So I like that. Yeah, most people underestimate how big something is or how um, low something can be. Because mm -hmm. um, things occur through recursion. So things cascade. So if you look back at what people uh, predicted about the internet in the early 90s, mm -hmm. they all missed it by a mile. It was way bigger. Every metric was way bigger than what people imagined. Uh, and same thing about crises. I mean, I think in 07, 08, people dramatically underestimated the feed forward effect, the compounding effect mm. uh, all these interconnected financial phenomena. People kept drawing straight lines and have to, have to adjust their straight lines mm. instead of drawing curves. Mm. So the third part, yes, being please. a verb. Yes. Being a verb. So being a verb is really hard because um, nouns are seductive. We like to name things, we like to be things, we like to have things. Mm -hmm. um, but life is dynamic, life is four dimensional. Mm -hmm. uh, we are nothing but the sum of our verbs. And so these nouns are total illusions. Mm -hmm. um, they, 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 they describe state, mm -hmm. but um, life only exists in four dimensions. So everything's dynamic, the state is an illusion. So we're, li we're living in these illusory state of nouns. Um, but if it can help the world think four-dimensionally as verbs, I think that'll unlock a lot of value because too many people, I think, just end up getting stuck. Mm. They become sedentary. Um, uh, my favorite one's entrepreneurship. So people, mm. um, you know, the word entrepreneurship comes from the French. You like French? Mm -hmm. um, so, and I, you know, you like French accent. I don't know how to say French entrepreneur correctly, but mm -hmm. entrepreneur means to start something. So it's a verb. So the origination of the word entrepreneurship is a verb. Somehow when they cross the Atlantic, we lost the verb form. So we have entrepreneur, which is a noun, entrepreneurship, which is a noun, entrepreneurial, which is an adjective, entrepreneurially, which is an adverb. We don't have the verb. Mm. Mm. So we talk about entrepreneurship. And meanwhile, there are people that actually do it, right? Mm. So the segregation between the noun and the verb that's happening in the world, um, yeah, I think that's a, uh, that's a 
it's a quick thing people can do to transform their lives mm. uh, is to be a verb live like a verb can you give some like, more examples like concretize that a little bit yeah so um, love is a big one right so mm -hmm. just actually love instead of uh, harboring and, and recruiting and building passions mm. um, and then take every problem statement and see if you can restate it as a verb so instead of saying there is an education problem mm. you can restate it as I will start a school mm. I see restate it yeah restate it as a verb mm. take that noun and just rewrite it and keep rewriting it until you get a verb out of it mm. one of the problems that really inspires me Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm into meditation, okay. intersection between spirituality and entrepreneur mm -hmm. as a verb, mm -hmm. right? Is um, really think about what is the cause of, like, how do you, what is consciousness? And then how do we alleviate human suffering? And hence why my interest in trans tech, right? Mm -hmm. How do we use technology as a way to help distribute that or share that more widely? Mm -hmm. Um, plant medicine, as an example, is the, the deepest work that I have come across as a tool, as a quote-unquote technology, to be able to, to do that. But it's also not very scalable, per se. So I'm going to think about that more, as in how do I turn this inquiry into a verb? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, um, yeah. And the answers are probably closer than you think, yeah? both by time and geography. Mm. Uh, you know, so my um, third interpretation of Dr. Glazer's comment about giving more people more running room mm. uh, is the f longevity mm. project mm. because people run out of time. Right. They get going and you know, their body's in decline and they quickly try to pass it on to the next generation through books and education. But imagine if um, life is your own, you have longitudinal, you can be, you unlock the human potential. So the, um, the way I think about the longevity movement is giving people running room mm. um, and so uh, you know one of the questions I was asked um, it didn't make the final cut on the uh, Today Show mm. um, was do you think we'll find the fountain of youth and where will we find it mm. uh, I never thought about it that way um, but the only place I've seen the fountain of youth is not in some mountain or piece of technology or, or plants the only place I've seen it is actually inside of you. Mm. Uh, you were all young once, like, like Buddha being two. So I've seen it. And we lose it. What we lose is the, the fountain of youth to me is recovery. Mm. And at 40, you lose the ability to recover. Mm. So all of a sudden, you can't tolerate uh, changes in temperature, changes in altitude, changes in light patterns, um, recovery from a broken bone, a cut. Um, jet lag, hangover, everything takes longer or it's, it's incomplete. So now rethinking about um, hypertension and diabetes. Mm. Maybe they're not separate diseases. Maybe it's just you lose the ability to recover your blood pressure and your sugar. Mm. Uh, in fact, what we measure in the annual checkup at a, from a physician's office is we measure your heart rate, blood pressure, glucose, cholesterol. Well, those things really don't change very much. Those are state variables. What erodes is your dynamism, your ability to recover your heart rate and blood mm. pressure after mm. exercise. So I think about youth as something that um, is youth as the recovery function, and what we lose is the ability to recover. So mm. to me, the future of longevity research is recovering the recovery. Mm. And I think the solutions are inside, mm. not in a mountain or in technology or elsewhere or in a plant. Mm. So I'm looking inside the human body mm. uh, for the gateway to solving the biology of aging. I love that. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that. Uh, this podcast is not about um, biology per se, but since we're on this topic, mm -hmm. I'm now very curious, <laughs> right? So given everything that you know so far, knowing mm -hmm. what you know now, how does one uh, cultivate this recovery capacity? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe not reverting back to when we were super young, but mm -hmm. like, is it through diet? Is it through exercise? Is it through some supplements? Like, what is it? I'm curious. 
you know, because yeah, obviously yeah. your life is going as well. You're in your 50s mm -hmm. right now, right? How do you plan to live to 120 as an example? Yeah, I don't, I don't have such plans or ambitions. I'm actually doing nothing. Nothing? Nothing. Nothing, okay. Um, no supplements, no diet, no exercise. But let's talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so um, my contribution to the field is uh, one dimension. Mm -hmm. So uh, biology, for whatever set of reasons, has only been a three-dimensional science. We focus on spatial resolution, getting mm -hmm. smaller and smaller and smaller, very reductionist. But we have no time domain. To me, life is a dynamic system. We should be thinking four-dimensionally. So Herman Minkowski helped um, Einstein integrate physics by giving him the time domain. Once you have space, time, Einstein could complete a picture. Uh, biology, for whatever reason, has remained the only field that remains three-dimensional. We have no time domain. And yet we're dynamic systems. So when you try to study a dynamic system with static models, we're going to conclude the wrong thing and probably do the wrong things. Mm. Um, so kind of rethinking first principles. Uh, for me, the first principle of biology is um, homeostatic capacity and nature and evolution selects for homeostatic capacity. Uh, and what you lose at 40 is the homeostatic capacity. That's the recovery function. Um, Wait, what's the word they use? Homeostatic. Homeostat homeostatic capacity. So homeostasis is Walter Cannon's concept. Right. It, that's the state of being in balance. Right. To me, the state of balance is a result of homeostatic capacity. So you have this I resilience. See. Think about it as bioresilience. Got it. Thank and you for that. Uh, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. And you know, it works so well for 40 years. The best, best healthcare system ever invented is the one nature gave you. Mm. It works for about 40 years, and then it turns off, and then your body starts losing homeostatic capacity. Mm. And we experience that as diabetes, hypertension, mm. you know, uh, loss of balance, memory, all those things, right? So to me, it's all one thing the loss of recovery function. Mm. You have a demand or a stressor of 1.0, and your response is 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.7 sequentially. Mm. So you start wobbling and you start reporting these weird blood pressure numbers and sugar numbers. And I think we've mistaken really one thing as being a thousand different things, which is impossible. Mm. It's, it's probably going to be one thing that's going wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so the most interesting question is, why does your body turn it off at 40? So to me, mm. aging is um, elegant. Um, it doesn't look elegant to most people, but to me, there's a set of biologic things that happen that are genetically encoded. And if you can find what those genes are that make you lose your recovery function, you can edit those out. I think that'd be the shortest path to ending aging. Mm. But the question you're asking is, what can we do in the meantime? Right. So I think the first thing you gotta always do is you gotta measure the right things. So I think we need to fundamentally reform biology and diagnostics, how we measure biologic systems. We should measure things dynamically. We should measure system capacity. We should measure system resilience mm. instead of system state. Um, so, um, like your heart rate and blood pressure, again, doesn't change your whole life. What you lose is your heart rate recovery and, right. heart and blood pressure recovery. Right. So let's measure those things. Let's actually turn everything into a stress test. Every diagnostic mm. test, measure it four-dimensionally. See mm. the system responsiveness. Mm. That's going to tell you much more about your actual biologic aging and your risk of dying and risk of disease. Mm. And the second, we should be improving homeostatic capacity instead of homeostasis. Mm. So right now, everything we're doing, you know, think about everything we're doing as a supplement. You can call it a nutraceutical, you can call it a real drug. But anytime you prop up the body, you actually make the body weaker. Mm. So the more you take a blood pressure lowering medicine, the more your baseline blood pressure goes higher. The more you drink caffeine, the more tired you get in the long run mm. because you're causing system atrophy. You're born with internal health, and then more you prop it up, the mm. weaker your, your, that, that muscle gets. So I think mm. everything we're doing in the current healthcare system, I think is uh, making the problem look good and you're solving the short-term problem, but you're creating a long-term problem. Mm. Uh, and everybody's a little bit happy, which is why it's dangerous, because no, there's no rebellion against the current system. Doctors are happy, patients are happy, pharma, pharma's happy, insurers are happy, because you solve the short-term problem. But what you're really doing is you're dressing up the problem. Mm. Uh, and so the, the product of the current healthcare system is basically old people. That's what we create. We need more healthcare. Mm. So that's a self-feeding beast. Mm. So as good as the current system is, you know, and I, I, I'm a doctor and I'm an you know, investor in healthcare, as good as the current system is, I think it's the absolute wrong system over the long run. Because mm. you're just creating old people that need more healthcare. That's a vicious cycle. Mm. So um, I'm both honored by it and just very disappointed. I think what we should focus on is putting the healthcare system back in the body where it started mm. and wean people off of healthcare, make mm. people healthy a whole lot healthy, longer. Yeah. Mm. And then let's see what happens in longevity as a call option. If you're healthy for a long period of time, if, you're, if, you're, if you have sustained health, your mortality rates should be low. If your mortality rate's low, 
you're going to live longer because the best way to promote longevity is to not die. So let's keep the mortality rates low for as long as possible for people and then unleash human capacity. Mm. Um, so we need to rethink diagnostics. We need to rethink therapeutics. And I think we're going to need to rethink lifestyle medicine. You mentioned diet and exercise. I think that's one of the swinging of the misses of the 20th century. Um, my intuition is it's not diet and it's not exercise. Mm. To me, it's change in diet and change in exercise. Mm. The more people think about these things as states, the more they focus on this is my diet, I think it's actually reducing metabolic, metabolic capacity. You know, the more gluten-free you are, mm. the more gluten intolerant you become. Mm. Think about that as a metaphor. So the narrower your diet, mm. the more atrophy causes. So I think even the lifestyle medicine, I think is exactly wrong. Interesting. So then what do you do? We need to test it. First of all, I have no validation. I'm literally making this stuff up. Yeah, that's good. So I'm helping yeah. support clinical trials mm. to test four-dimensional Mm. interventions that are three-dimensional interventions so what I'm hearing you say mm -hmm. is it's not a one-size-fits-all because it's a state change right mm -hmm. rather so I'm here a lot of emphasis on like the dynamics the, mm -hmm. the dynamism mm -hmm. so perhaps is again using my scientific understanding of this perhaps some overly simple simplistic is cycle on cycle off so you can maybe do I'm just making things up as we go as we speak um, you do this particular protocol for a period of time, then you cycle off, you do some other protocol some other time, then so that way your body gets holistically stimulated and then exactly develop right. that you That's know exactly right. capacity continuously. Because I'm a huge believer actually going back to kind of philosophically what this whole podcast is about. That exponential growth lies in the edge of our comfort zone, mm -hmm. lies in adversity. Mm -hmm. If a body is not challenged, mm -hmm. you know, we got to get compl complacent, you know, capacity kind of lower and lower, get diminished over time. But if you get too much stress on any system, your body gets, you know, burn out, right? Breaks. Yeah, yeah. So it's the sweet spot. My point of view is, you know, continue to push that envelope of comfort. Yeah. So that's sweet spot is called you stress. Again, mm -hmm. everything's about you. But in this case, it's spelled E-U. Yeah. Uh, overstressed is distress, your right. body will mount the stress response. What you want is small amounts of stress mm -hmm. that build resilience, build capacity, like building a muscle, or it's mm -hmm. like vaccination. Small amounts will let you build a buffer. Mm -hmm. You're building homeostatic capacity. So we can actually use small amounts of stress in every dimension. So again, it's not exercise, it's change in exercise. Different time of day, different mm -hmm. routine, different weights. Don't let your fall body fall in the groove, but think multidimensionally in terms of the concept. So everything about the world right now is using technology to reduce your own workload. Mm. You know, we used to be able to have capacity to tolerate 40 degrees and capacity to tolerate 100 degrees. Mm -hmm. Now we're trying to be 70 degrees all the time. Mm -hmm. We have heaters, air conditioning, we wear clothes, we move to California. Your blood isn't thinning when mm -hmm. you go to California, you're just losing homeostatic capacity. Mm -hmm. You're debuffering because you're offloading the work on the technology. Mm -hmm. So by not having enough you stress, good stress, you actually become weaker. Same thing with light. We're supposed to live in ambient light, sunlight during the day and, and darkness at night. Mm -hmm. We don't experience dynamic range of light. Mm. We have indoor jobs, roof over our heads during the day, and we turn on all the lights at night. So we're losing this dynamism of our natural experience. Uh, we used to see things that are six inches away and 30 miles away constantly. Mm. Now we stare 18 inches. We're losing dynamic range of focal length. Our muscles have ex um, flexion and extension, and instead we're living ergonomically neutral all day. So the more you rely on technology to do the work for you, the more you debuffer, mm -hmm. you become more brittle, and that's a gateway to lots of dysfunctions because you're losing resilience. So everything about modern life is corrupting your own ability to maintain health. So mm. the answer is very simple. You go do the opposite. Mm. So actually go spend more time in the sun, more time in the snow, more time in the mountains, more time in, out in scuba diving, um, you know, more time uh, eating different foods, listening to different talks. Mm -hmm. uh, constantly manage your dynamic range. Um, and don't do it in extremes because I had to really um, so many of the tech entrepreneurs around here started doing extremes. They misunderstood what I was saying. Mm. They're doing ice baths, cold baths. I never said ice bath and cold bath. Because mm. if, you, if you've lose, lost capacity and you start doing extremes, you're going to have a heart attack and die. Mm. So maybe if you're 20, you can do it. But if you're 70 and doing ice bath, cold bath, a percentage of those people are going to die. Mm. I think these extremes are really dangerous. I've never, I never said extremes. Mm. I said small amounts and grow this so you don't actually mount a distress response. So I think what's going on right now in the tech world worries me a lot. I've actually gone on media and to really coach people against it. I never said that. I said, you stress small muscles. You would never go to Kilimanjaro in a helicopter. You would die. 
Like, like acclimate along the way. Like you didn't train. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you, once you debuffer, you're brittle. So mm-hmm. you got to train slowly. So build slowly. And that's not an attractive message. Everybody wants extremes because they want the extraordinary. No, no, no. Right. This is the ordinary. They want Just the use. quick fix. Quick, quick fix, yeah. yeah. Build resilience. Yeah, the ego is really funny. So I, I'm actually, I fit that profile so perfectly. Because <laughs> I'm always pushing the envelope. Right? Gosh, so when you're people, so modest. <laughs> yeah. So I always like, oh, yeah, let's, let's, let's go for Nihape as an example. Mm-hmm. Like, or Sananga is extremely uh, intense mm-hmm. for most people. And then, yeah, I continue to do it almost daily. And people thought I'm pretty crazy. But, um, but maybe, I don't know. I, I really appreciate this conversation because it allows me to like, oh, okay, I may, I may break. <laughs> I want to stay in that use. Well, when you're on. young, you can do it. Because you have tremendous reserve. Mm. As you get older, those things become harder. So mm. it's, it's a mindfulness, right? And your body will tell you. Mm. Um, an example, a practical example of this is, I don't think deep breathing is the answer. I think alternating deep breathing and breath holding. So again, it's the change mm. is where the value is, not the advice of deep breathing. Does, does that make sense? Mm. So, so the Wim Hof method, I don't know if you know about it, but then... I know Wim, yeah. Oh, you do? Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that, to me, is a little too extreme for me. I, I love his thinking, right? Mm. I love his thinking, mm. and he's a great guy. Um, but I think for people that are not like him, he's a unique specimen. Yeah. For the average person his age that suddenly do that, I think it's going to mount the stress response. So, mm. But again, t- time will tell. All this stuff I'm telling you has to be empirically validated. Mm. So we need to do more science on this. We need mm. to measure the right things. Uh, everybody, you know, and I, I think we will say the same thing too. Everybody's on their own trajectory. Mm-hmm. So relative to his own trajectory, I think what he's doing is exceptional. But everybody's probably got a different tolerance level. Mm-hmm. And building up that tolerance to me, um, you know, th- that to me intuitively is where the answer is going to be. Like mm-hmm. building it up gradually rather than suddenly. So actually on that note, in, t- in terms of the internal state, mm-hmm. uh, I love this book called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Canceling to concentration camp survivor, psychiatrist by, um, by, by training. This sentence he said, between stimulus and response, there is lies a space. And in that space lies our freedom and growth. So why did I say that? I say that because the ego, right? Our ego mind, our propensity wants to say, all right, let's, let's go for the extreme because I'll have the payoff faster, easier versus the, I don't know what you call it, higher self or whatever, would say, all right, let's make sure that we stay in, we do this, but we, we do it correctly or whatever. So how do you, in that space, for you, June, or what your advice would be to allow people to listen to the internal state and make the best decision? Well, you just said it. So I think you're... Rather than going through a program, which is generic and one size fits all, mm-hmm. everybody's in a different age, different background. So listening f- to within rather than to these external messages. Remember, all the external messages are designed for salesmanship. Mm-hmm. They're trying to sell. They're trying to sell the extraordinary. If you tune that out and just listen and just be present, your body will tell you and guide you how much you can push when to dial back. Uh, and, and that's the best way to grow that strength. Mm. Strength and resilience, by the way, are the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and, but that's not marketable. What's marketable is extraordinary. Right. It's, the, it's the extremes, right? Um, so the, you just have to understand that the, the marketplace is going to select for that. Um, but you don't have to select any of that. You, just, you, know, you can have your own internal conviction um, that it's okay. Mm. Like uh, what, what I'm doing and um, in, um, in being patient in that regard. Mm. Uh, again, I described earlier how impatient I am. Uh, uncertainty, but other things that make sense to me, you know, I probably look very patient because um, you know, cause my, my mind goes quiet and I'm able to pay attention and I'm able to do things a little more slowly at my own pace. Mm. So last thing, mm-hmm. you said so many beautiful pieces of wisdom, nuggets of wisdom. Um, if there's anyone listening still who wants to take action, who's inspired by your, your, your narrative, by your thought, you know, your, 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 your way of thinking, what's one thing that they could do to tactically, right, as a daily discipline or tactically go out and try it for themselves as a way to, to uh, take some action about this, to, to turn everything that we share about into a verb? 
what would, what would be one thing that you recommend them do? You know, I think taking responsibility for others. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have forgotten that because um, we've become so self-involved over the last 10,000 years, especially the last 200 years. Um, so there's a lot of self out there, uh, self-directedness, self-help. Um, so if you just step outside of that and just realize um, there are others involved mm -hmm. um, and take responsibility for them and you do it judicious. You can't, you know, take responsibility for everybody. Um, but it'll just change that orientation from self to other. So many things will domino from there because it looks contrarian relative to the main world. Mm -hmm. So I, I think a lot of good will come from taking responsibility for others. Um, you know, one of the subjects we didn't get to talk about, uh, maybe we could leave it for a future conversation because um, uh, I, I understand a lot of your audience members are male, is um, there used to be more uncles around mm. and so much of our learning was uh, not just vertical from our dads because after, after age 13, you're not wired to want to hear your dad anymore. Mm. Most kids out there are like, dad, please don't tell me, right? Right, because you, you, you develop that self-identity and then exactly. your parents are no longer the exactly. sole source exactly. for information. And in nature, we used to live in kin communities, so there'd be uncles around, mm -hmm. just listen to your uncles. And so now, the typical boy growing up um, can't turn to your dad after 13. You don't have any uncles around, they live far away. So you li start listening to the messages of others, uh, especially media. Mm. I think that's where the corruption starts. So um, my friend started this thing called Man Camp. Mm. Um, we took 65 guys out of the woods. All ages? All ages, yeah. Mm. Uh, around some you know, common values. And one of the outcomes of that gathering um, um, was the understanding that the role of the avunculars disappeared. The, the role of the avuncular. The role of un yeah, uncles, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so we signed up to be each other's uncles. Mm. Um, so that's an action item like we're taking responsibility mm. for someone beyond not only ourselves and just our direct kids um, and as that replicates a completely different type of society emerges mm. um, and I think one that people will be a lot more proud of mm. actually say a little bit more about that because I'm actually curious right part of this movement this noble warrior is well one to have a call to action hey men specifically if you're interested be, to be the best version of yourself, listen to this. Listen to wise uncles, what they all have to say. You know, there are different points of view. And then, I don't know, maybe in the future we'll do retreats or something like that. But I'm curious, you guys are already doing that. What is the, what the thought that you put behind it and then some of the, the benefits of what works and what doesn't work? I'm curious. Yeah, we still don't know, right? Yeah. So it, it's all emerging. You know, we... Um, you know, we, we don't over-design, it's very improvisational, but we mm. pay attention. Mm. And so we didn't go in there thinking, oh, we need to be uncles. Mm. That was just an emergent property uh, of actually having things be unplanned, mm. um, being present, mm. and just noticing, uh, removing all the externalities, mm. uh, all the typical distractions. Like, so a lot of the truth just kind of self-emerged. Um, and so it, it, it was able to, you know, we were able to turn the action item. Like, let's, let's take responsibility for others. Like, mm. let's, let's be each other's uncles, kids' uncles. Mm. Right. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's, uh, it's one of my favorite subjects for another time. Um, yeah, I'd love to chat again. You're just such a fountain of wisdom. Um, thank so you so much for sharing everything. Oh, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you yeah. for your time and your interest and what you're doing for your audience. Yeah. Uh, I'm eager to listen to some of the other podcasts from others. Yeah. Um, you know, my first advice always is to get the advice of others too. I mean, uh, I have my point of view. Mm. There's so much embedded wisdom out there, mm. uh, and you never stop learning. So, um, you know, again, I'm envious of what you do, and I'm envious of your uh, what your audience gets to do in yeah. uh, listening to Noble Warrior. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And June, I want to, number one, really acknowledge you for your presence. You haven't broke, broken eye contact the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite impressive. Well, you're very captivating as a person. So oh, well, thank um, you. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your time today. Yeah. Um, and I also want to acknowledge you for just um, being willing to go wherever we wanted to go. And very, I mean, honestly, this is one of the reasons I started the podcast. 
to have mm-hmm. this level of like depth and conversation. Mm-hmm. So we really want to acknowledge you for everything you brought to the table. And then for those that are listening, I hope you really got the everything that June has so generously shared uh, with, with all of you. So take some action. Thank you. Yeah. And you're a really great co-pilot. <laughs> Thank you.